Target, good morning um, from Bain Consulting. Are you in Sydney or uh, somewhere else? Yes, hi, I'm based in Sydney. I'm a partner in our Sydney office and uh, I lead our sustainability and responsibility practice here in Australia, which is sort of how we define um, ESG. And uh, I've also been leading our diversity, equity and inclusion program for Australia over the last four years and more recently for our Asia Pacific countries. Uh, and thank you for this interview and for having me. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. What a beautiful day it is. So I've got, I've got a couple of questions for you. From Bain's perspective, how would you describe Australia's opportunity in the sustainability economy? Um, look, for Australia in particular, our point of view and what we hear from business leaders is that Australia actually has a great opportunity to become a leader. A leader in what? First, in producing and exporting renewable and clean energy. We have vast landscapes. We have the ability to produce a large amount of solar power, power, of wind energy, and we can use that to power Australia and export it to our neighbours. Uh, and we also have a great opportunity in um, extracting and exporting rare earth minerals that are required for the net zero transition. This said, it's not going to be easy. There's actually a lot that needs to happen before Australia can become this exporting power. Um, needs to have technology in order, in order to be able to scale the production and transport of this energy, most importantly, uh, so that we uh, can export it beyond our borders. And added to that opportunity, I think, is not just about Australia's natural resources. I think there's a lot that we can do to go beyond that and to really build out our technology and STEM capabilities and encourage innovation and then be an exporter of that talent. Uh, tech to store and transmit and transport renewable energy, for example, uh, through um, batteries, um, using solar or wind energy to, to produce hydrogen to export. So there's still a lot to be done to reach that potential, but there's definitely a great opportunity there. And if I can just add one more point, there's actually a, a few steps uh, that are required in that process. The first one is as a country, and I think there's a big role that the government can play in that, we need to be really clear about what our vision is so that business and communities can really be unified in the direction that we're moving into. And what we're hearing is really that ambition sort of net zero by 2050 is, is, is great, great to have. So the 43% from the government by 2030 is also a good, uh, well, good, let's define good, whether yeah, it gets yeah. us 1.5 degree or not, but at least it's like a stake in the ground by 2030. But it, it feels that what business leaders are missing to get more confidence in investing, more confidence in developing the right products and the right tech is actually a transition plan and a transition plan that is very tangible towards those milestones, that is not overly input focused, as in you can do that, you can't do that, you shouldn't do that, but is very outcome based. These are the various points that we want to get to. Businesses, community, it's kind of your role to understand how you're gonna get there, but we really need to monitor these milestones. And then the last point is, as I said, we need to uplift our STEM capabilities. And that's going to be a few steps. We're first, I think, going to have to import that knowledge and that talent. Mm -hmm. And so we know that with COVID, it's been quite difficult to get sort of foreign students, foreign uh, professors and teachers sort of kind of bring some of that back in. And then at the same time, really sort of upskill our uh, universities, improve our degrees and get as a lot more students into those areas of studies. Yeah, we have such opportunity in this country. We just need to raise our ambition and capture that opportunity. We are we're truly blessed here. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So how would you describe Australia's maturity in terms of sustainability compared to France or, you know, other developed countries? Yeah, so Maybe not, um, I mean, I have a bit more knowledge about the French landscape, <laughs> obviously, given uh, given this is where I'm from, but um, it's a bit double-edged. Look, we're not starting from a leading position versus a set of countries like Europe, for example. Yeah. They're obviously ahead, sort of regulation, policies, 
uh, all of that is really driving those countries towards more effort and more um, awareness uh, that something needs to be done and be done quickly. But uh, we can definitely see signs of catching up. Look, there's more ambitious targets. As we described, 43% does not get you to 1.5 degree scenario by 2050, but at least it's better yeah. than the 28% that we had a few months ago. Um, and so really there's that conscious move towards having more ambitious targets and more awareness of the urgency of the issue. And we see that in the businesses that we work with. I mean, it, and, and we can get to that a little bit later, but there's definitely that um, the urgency starting to create itself. But there's a there's a few challenges for Australia, right? I mean, every country has their own challenge, but we have an enormous dependency on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. We're one of the top 10 global producers. Exports are a meaningful part of our own economy. And so it's gonna be hard to like turn off the tap and move completely to renewables, especially from uh, if we don't have the technology to make this our new strength. Um, and then policies, we need more policies to encourage businesses to invest to um, and to really drive the, the scenario that gets us uh, in line with the, with, with the, with the Paris um, Accord. Yeah, I just want to come back to this notion of urgency. Mm -hmm. now, how important is it ESG as a strategic lever for Aussie organisations today? Mm -hmm. and, and are you seeing an increased urgency across the business ecosystem? You know, is ESG sustainability becoming a top priority? Um, um, yes, I know. And there's actually quite a lot of variation in organizations and how they see ESG. It does feel like there is more sense of awareness and urgency. It And it comes from different places, right? For some of them, it's, um, it's sort of the external pressures from customers, from employees, from stakeholders. And there's a very common view that there is a risk there to be yep. mitigated. Yep. And that risk is either from your stakeholders or just by climate change itself. Like there's an incredible number of businesses that have been affected by fires, by floods, by um, sort of conflicts in the world. And companies think about the impact that this has on their business yep. and what they need to do. And there's some industries where we really see that this is intrinsically linked to the performance of your business. Look at insurance. Insurance and environment are so incredibly linked um, and more from a risk perspective. What we're starting to see, though, is there's a growing number of businesses that are starting to see ESG and E in particular as a way to create value. Yep. And this is actually Bain's uh, view on sustainability, which is we have that sort of on one on one hand, you need to protect yourself from the risk, yep. sort of either to your business, for, uh, from your stakeholders, or from uh, the, the climate change itself. But also, this is a great opportunity for value creation. Um, and there's a ton of examples of how this creates value. You can lower your costs. Like, for example, if you're a retailer, you use less packaging. Uh, you can access new market segments. Uh, this is actually uh, growingly part of businesses' employee value propositions. Employees want to know that their businesses are doing something right for the environment from a social perspective, and it creates additional equity value. And so I think this is a, a, a growing sentiment we still have the really strong urgency on the risk side of things, but then businesses are starting to see the value that will stem from this. Indeed. If you had to give one top tip to an organization that's just starting out on their sustainability journey, what would that be? Look, I'm a strategy consultant, so obviously I'm gonna start there. <laughs> uh, and I think the most important thing is to really make sustainability a core tenet yep. of the company's strategy. If it's left to the side, if sustainability is buried like four or five levels down in the organization, where more often than not, it's actually been the case up until now, the goals will be sort of, you will get there by sort of few people of your organizations pushing for marginal change. If there really is a desire and an ambition to make a business sustainable, I would greatly encourage leaders to actually have this as a key pillar of their strategy. 
and and there's ways to do to do this so we have uh so we talk about a future back view when we talk about strategy think about what your business and your industry is going to look like in 10 20 years what do you believe is going to be true by then and how do you actually start from what you have today and build the capabilities and the skills to get to that image of the future in 10 to 20 years yeah. and that's how we believe companies can be successful in that endeavor okay now a slightly more difficult question what would you consider the biggest challenges moving forward in terms of accelerating climate action towards this sort of future net zero goal so the challenges that we face um the, so there's there's a few if, if i start with kind of the challenges for businesses and for corporate leaders um i think there's a risk that is perceived by those leaders in being um, sort of first in market with sustainability. Um, and, and what that does is there's a bit of a stalemate situation where everyone stares at each other, trying to see who's going to move on what and then be fast followers. And that's legitimate, right? There's uncertainty on what the right solutions are going to be. No one wants to invest a lot into something that's going to fail uh, or realize that they did the wrong thing. There's a growing risk about being too ambitious and then being um, taxed of greenwashing or even sued by your by your customers or, or your stakeholders. We can already see examples in Europe of the police raiding uh, some buildings um, on allegations of greenwashing. Yep. And so I think there's a risk there that there is a, a bit of a meek ambition because no one's really leading the pack to go towards an ambitious goal. Um, the other challenge is that I think no one business or organization alone can solve this problem for Australia. So there sure. needs to be systemic change and that change needs to be cross industry and cross stakeholders and sort of having the government partner with businesses, partner with communities and sort of reaching policies and processes that enable that systemic change will be um, once we can actually sort of get this together and break that silo, then it feels like it will be a, a, a sort of an acceleration towards Australia's path to net zero. And, and then the last challenge that I want to highlight is um, is the customer what we call the say do gap. So customers, investors, everyone wants greener outcomes, but I think there's actually a reluctance to paying a premium for it. Yep. As a consumer, you expect from your supermarket that they might have sustainable products, but you're not necessarily going to pay the extra 20 cents, $1 for that product because, I mean, cost of living has, as we yes. know, increased uh, a lot over the last uh, few months and few years. Uh, and there's really a pinch on consumers, but th they have this, ooh, I really want those greener outcomes and, and I'd pay for it. But then when, when it comes to it, then people are not willing to do it. Um, and so these are some of the challenges. Lots of challenges, but lots of opportunities. Aga, thank you very much for your time this morning. We look forward to seeing you and hearing more from you at Impact X in about six weeks from now. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Too.